Hi there. Welcome back to BCIT TTED 5060 for Technology Teacher Education, where we're looking at the design and construction of a tethered mini sumo robot. In previous videos, we've taken a look at how to calculate uh, the best gear ratio and wheel diameter for your robot, uh, how to create a orthographic drawing of what your student's robot design might look like using manual drafting tools, there's no requirement that you use manual drafting tools. CAD works great. But uh, anyway, we've got that done using manual drawing. And then we took a look at how to create the layout drawings or the stretch out drawings or whatever you want to call them for sheet metal, taking into account the fact that when you bend a piece of sheet metal, there is a radius around that corner and you can't use the dimensions directly off your orthographic. You have to modify them a little bit so that everything comes out looking right in the end. So here we go. We had those drawings finished at the uh, end of our last uh, video. And then what I did was I ran them uh, up to the office and popped them through on the photocopier so that I had a couple of photocopy drawings. The original drawings right here uh, are to be kept nice and clean and tidy for reference and to be handed in with the project when it's all done. Okay, uh, I've taken a uh, pair of scissors or in my case a um, paper cutter and chopped these down approximately to size and I found a couple of pieces of uh, sheet metal, in this case 16 gauge sheet aluminum, uh, that are going to be about the right size for making what we need to make. And the first step in putting these together is uh, going to be to, well, first of all, I double check to make sure that our, um, uh, that our pieces right here were the right size. Make sure your photocopy is, photocopier is photocopying at 100% scale. And then uh, grab a piece of glue stick. You can use a spray adhesive as well. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put glue stick on the back of these drawings. Uh, photocopied at two sides, never mind. Uh, we're going to put uh, glue stick on the back of those sides so that we can adhere them directly onto our sheet metal and it saves you having to go and do all the scribe or layout on your piece of sheet metal. Now, if you want to teach those skills, teach those skills. Um, use a scriber. Use a uh, machine a square. That's all great for doing layout work. Uh, this sometimes goes a little bit quicker. One thing that I also do with this is I with the high school students don't immediately go up to sheet metal. I'll usually get a piece of cardstock and have them glue these onto a piece of cardstock and then do all of their folding operations with the piece of cardstock so that they can show me which tools they're going to use and what sequence of bends that they're going to do. Because certainly if you're getting into some more complex designs, this one's pretty simple, but if you get into more complex designs, you really need to think your sequence of bends through in advance. So my next step, I'm gonna put some glue stick on and uh, put those onto the sheet metal. So whether you're putting it on the sheet metal or whether you're putting it on the cardstock, whatever you do, make sure that they use a piece of scrap to do their um, uh, glue sticking with because you want to get the glue stick out to all the edges of your drawing so that every edge is going to adhere nicely. And then you're going to press it down onto a piece of sheet metal and it should hold really nicely. And let's uh, see right here. Always fun doing this with just one hand while I'm holding the camera. And there's our piece of sheet metal right on here. And pick a spot where that seems to fit in fairly nicely. Try to make sure it's off to the side. Push it down nice and firm. On here you can see from my first cut I've uh, actually used a square and a pencil mark to take this out to the edge so I get one edge for sure coming off the shear that's going to be nice and square to everything. Get those pieces tucked down and then it's time to move on to the next step. Okay, now we're going to do our first couple of rough cuts here to get things down to size. We're on the shears and you can see that one square edge that I marked out to the very far corners is going to be my first cut just to get uh, one reference edge on here. Now keep in mind, I'm doing this with aluminum, but with high school students, I'd have them do this with a, uh, there we go, with a piece of um, cardstock first, so that if they run into any problems, <clears throat> it's not going to end up costing you very much money in terms of supplies and materials. And there we 
you go. Now we can use that one reference edge to cut that nice and square. And just go all the way around and trim everything up. Paying attention to detail because you measured this all very accurately. So you may as well cut it out accurately. And again, right on there. We're going to trim that one up a little bit later on. So. There we go. We'll do that for the next one too. Remember to pick up all those pieces that uh, drop. Nobody likes uh, when you leave a mess behind. And now it's time to center punch each of the inside corners or any place where we want to put a hole. And I haven't figured out how to hold a punch and swing a hammer with uh, one hand, so you're just going to have to accept the fact that I'm doing some center punching. The reason I was center punching the inside uh, corners was so that I could use a nice little Whitney punch to punch out the inside corners. Yeah, it's fun doing this with one hand. So that when I punch out the inside corners right there, that's going to create um, a nice little curved section for when I cut into the corners and uh, it's gonna allow me to have a little bit of radius on the bends right there. You'll see how that works out when we start doing our uh, other cuts in our fold. So time to punch. Okay, we're lucky to have a little four-ton hand notcher right here, and uh, this makes cutting the inside corners really quite simple. Although, you do need to give it a good tug every now and then, so we'll... Okay, two-hand job. As you can see, the uh, little holes that we've punched on there help uh, to get everything lined up and uh, make sure that your corners uh, don't end up with any sharp little indentations on them. You'll also notice that we've cleverly placed a bucket right underneath the hand notcher to catch all the pieces that fall off. Remember not to leave a mess behind. Now these last couple of corners right here, um, you might not have a hand notcher in your shop, and that's where the classic shears come in. There we go over here, and we can come right in here. And of course, we could have cut all of these corners uh, coming out here. It just would have been one cut at a time. Uh, with the shears, you could do it with hand shears if you wanted as well. But we're going to use that to uh, finish up the last couple of corners right on here because the notcher couldn't handle the, uh, the sharp angle in there. And this is a place where I really like having those holes pre-punched is because when that shear comes together and meets right on that corner, instead of having to cut past the line, oh darn, it wiggled a little bit while I was trying to do it with just one hand in there. I'm gonna have to tidy that up in a second. But you can see that that gives the um, shear a place to meet. And if both uh, cuts go straight down into the corner, as they would if I'd been doing that with two hands, then they would have met up at the hole and that piece would have popped right out. The shear, of course, can lead to a little bit of bending in your pieces. Um, so just make sure that you uh, get that straightened out before you go on to any next steps. Now I'm just thinking my project through a little bit, and this may or may not apply to your project, but I'm going to make one bend right in here and then go back to the shop and sit down and transfer a few more holes onto it and straighten a few things out. So let's just get that up to... 90 degrees. I always tend to bend a little bit over 90, but I think I'm pretty close that time. You do want to get as close as you can. Okay, there we go. Now that I've got the parts cut out, I made just one bend because I was thinking a little bit ahead and knowing that this gearbox had to fit in here really nicely. And you know, sometimes I make mistakes on measuring and all that, and when you've got the real thing in your hand, you can use that to line it up. The other thing is we marked off a center line right there. So if I line up this edge, let me come in right here. Let's see if I can do that without casting a shadow on everything. 
line up that edge just beautifully with the center line and line that seam up right here beautifully with the center line. Then I can take a look and say, oh, let's move that forward a little bit and make sure that that's exactly in place. And we can use a type of punch called the transfer punch to mark exactly where our hole is going to go. And a transfer punch is special because as you can see, they come in different diameters. And so unlike a center punch, you can get the exact perfect diameter punch and slip it exactly into the hole that you're going to be working on and you can transfer a pre-existing hole perfectly onto uh, your workpiece. So the transfer punch is a really handy tool when you're trying to make two things fit together and one of them's already got holes marked in them. So we're going to use the transfer punch to do that. So there we go. We've now got uh, two holes punched in there absolutely perfectly that will line up with the Tamiya gearbox. Even though this uh, Tamiya gearbox is a little bit banged up, it's uh, good enough for me to serve as a reference and make sure that those holes are exactly where I want them. Now, it's a good thing to think about your project as you go along at this page because as I was thinking about it, I went through this train of thought that said, oh gee, the motors are missing from this old gearbox and then I'll have to put more motors on it. And then I thought, oh, where would the wires run? And then I thought, wires. We need to get power from the battery and the control box down into here. So we need to have a connection uh, from the uh, motor compartment up to the battery compartment. And the battery compartment's gonna be tucked in right here. I think I'm gonna need a little hole right here to run some wires through. So I'm just gonna run over and punch that out right now. Now I'm going to finish up most of my bends uh, and folds using the box and pan brake. We do have a few different alternatives. I bought uh, this little uh, press brake right here that fits into a vise on Amazon. And for small bends you can line that up right in there. And uh, then just as you squeeze it together right in there, that just presses your piece right down into that groove and keep going until you get to your 90 degrees. Go slightly over because you know it's going to spring back a little bit when you let go. And Oh, we've sheared that little piece of paper off in there. It served its purpose well. And there you can see we got a fairly nice bend. Not quite all the way to 90, but it's a small bend. You can probably push that together um, by hand. Or I'll show you, we've got another couple of tools that can help tidy up uh, joints like that. So if you do need to fix up a joint like that, we've got these uh, nifty sheet metal pliers right in here and that can help you focus your bend right down at the corner so that everything comes out nice and square when you're all done. You can also accomplish a lot by uh, just using C-clamps and pieces of angle iron to build your own uh, bending jigs off the edge. Not, not of a workbench like this but one of the uh, sturdier workbenches down in the shops and uh, so if you don't have all the bending tools available to you you can get creative and uh, use you, use your imagination and figure out a way to solve a problem you're just folding metal but uh, like i say with high school students i always get them to do it in cardstock first because when they run into that problem they can exercise their imagination on uh, cardstock a lot less expensively than they can on sheet metal Okay, so I've come back down here just to finish up a few more uh, bends and try to get everything nice to 90 degrees so the corners match up. And you can see how that little pre-punched hole actually, um, it looked big, but now that you've bent the corners, it's going to work out okay right in there. I'm cheating a little bit here by not getting my fingers perfectly set up for my final bend. But uh, anyway, uh, that should be close enough. And this 
piece now should just slide right down in there and let's check at the end right there that's looking not too bad at all don't cover the camera up like that let's get in there take a good look at that i think i can live with that as the front of my mini sumo robot okay still got a few things to do on here okay so here we go after a few more bends i uh, took it over to the um, belt sander now normally i don't let my grade 9 and 10 students do this on the belt sander things get caught on there way too easy and they um, uh, have a chance of not only hurting their fingers but ripping up the belt on the sander and all that but uh, so what i have them do is i'll have them use a deburring tool uh, or a file or sometimes even just a piece of emery cloth but you'll notice like on the corners right in here and right in here you don't want those to be sharp you want them to meet up nice and neatly down here at the very front uh, you know you want things to sit flush to the ground and you can see that that belt sander really helped me um, get that squared off right there try and get that in focus a little bit better for you you know ideally your uh, edge joints meet up fairly nicely I'm a little unhappy in fact very unhappy with this one right here on the battery box I think that was one of the ones where I was uh, trying to do my fold while holding the camera and talking to the camera so I was a little bit distracted doing that but it should all come together and when you're done you should be able to rub your hand over top of any of the edges or joints and not worry that you're going to cut open an artery okay now I do allow a little bit of leeway that if somebody wants to sharpen the front there that the front might be a little bit uh, sharp but it shouldn't be that uh, burr on the edge that you get when you're doing a lot of sheet metal work you should be able to get in there and remove that and get that tidied up so uh, we've got one or two left thing, uh, things left to do right here one of which is to get uh, these holes right here to match the mounting holes right on the surface uh, so that we can use one screw running right through there to hold everything together so again I'm going to use the transfer punches for doing that and uh, then uh, we also still have in our original drawing uh, we have a spacer that goes right in here and that spacer is designed uh, to separate the gearbox from the top of the uh, pack right here so we'll need to get that in there so that we can fit our wheel in there properly and once we've got that done uh, we should have uh, the beginnings of a mini sumo probably time to uh, put a little bit of paint on it and make it look nice uh, or some kind of decoration we've still got to add a tether pole for it uh, to get the electricity up to our controller but the basics of a mini sumo are all in there and ready to go okay so here we go we've got uh, holes drilled right in there so they match up beautifully on that side and beautifully right in there so that battery box is going to fit on the top uh, the big test now we designed it to be 97 by 97 how did we do so time to break out the calipers here and let's try and do this with just one hand Ooh, 96.35. I think that's going to be acceptable. Uh, we better check that in the other direction. Let's see right here. How are we doing? Ooh, it's supposed to be 97. We're at 99. It looks like maybe one or two of those bends could be just a little bit tighter. But that's why we designed it to be 97. We're off by two millimeters and we're still under the 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter limit. So this is a competitive robot that won't uh, run into any problems with the sizing box. And oh, one final test. We've got our battery box up top and we need to be able to fit the battery into it. Again, don't short out your batteries when you try this, but uh, they fit right in there. Wire runs right down in there. We'll be able to map that around. And batteries are out of sight. 
our spacer block that's going to go in the middle to separate the gearbox out because right now the gearbox wouldn't be sitting low enough. Uh, that'll set the gearbox down a little bit and that spacer block will add some weight because even with the batteries in there now we're still well under 500 grams. We still got to put wheels on it and a coat of paint and a few things on there but when it comes to quickly folding up a simple sheet metal mini sumo robot uh, there's some tips to get you started. Okay. Uh, looking forward to seeing your designs. Feel free, if you're not all that confident about designing uh, something from scratch, to follow what I've done right here. Play around with the dimensions a little or cut out a, a, a groove right, uh, a space right here so that your wheels are showing, maybe a, a fender or something like that. But have a little bit of fun and there is a basic little tethered mini sumo almost ready to go. We'll talk about the electronics a bit later on.